Mr. President, uh, I've come to the floor to talk uh, again on the devastating so-called Ryan budget, which of course is now the Romney Ryan budget. Uh, and I will speak about that very shortly. But before, I, I also want to focus uh, some attention on the how the Ryan budget is preventing us from getting a farm bill this year. Um, we have a farm bill that we passed in the Senate, but the House can't get it done. Earlier this year, the Senate passed a bipartisan farm bill. It had broad support of Republicans and Democrats, all farm groups, consumer groups, environmental groups. So with all of that support, you would think it would be easy for the House but the House has not followed suit. Unable or perhaps unwilling to bring the Farm Bill to the House floor, they similarly refuse to take up the Senate bill. And so our farm policy has languished at a time when literally farm country is burning up because of a drought. And this week, as I understand it, the House is going to adjourn and go home without taking any action on a Farm Bill leaving our farmers and ranchers in the lurch, when all the House needs to do is take up the Senate pass bill and pass it, send it to the President, he'll sign it. And again, we pass the bill here. Republicans, Democrats, all the farm groups, consumer groups, environmental groups, all support it. We even made a $23 billion contribution to reducing the deficit in the farm bill. Well, it seems worth noting that one of the reasons the House can't act is seemingly because of the Ryan budget, which, of course, as we know, is just a proposal. The House has passed it. I think they voted on it 34 times, if I'm not mistaken. But the Ryan budget calls for draconian cuts to our federal nutrition programs. That's the SNAP program, otherwise people know us food stamps that helps low-income families, or helps a family that may be modest income, but they've lost a job and they're in transition and need some support for one or two months before they get back on their feet. It helps with summer feeding programs for kids, elderly feeding programs for low-income elderly, uh, feeding programs that go into daycare centers. In other words, it was... It's the idea that you know, we have an abundance and we're going to use that abundance to help make sure that no one goes to bed hungry and that people are adequate, have adequate nutrition in our society. Well, the, the Ryan budget made a draconian cut in the nutrition programs. And many of the House Republicans are saying they won't support a farm bill that doesn't have those draconian cuts, which I'm proud to say the Senate bill does not have. And I hasten to add that as the former chair of the Senate Ag Committee, I've long advocated cutting wasteful ag spending. For years, I led the effort to get rid of direct payments, which the Senate bill does, finally, contributing to, I said, a $23 billion in deficit reduction. So this situation, I think, really shows what the Ryan budget is. It's emblematic of the Ryan budget. Not only is the Ryan budget devastating for working and low-income Americans, but its insistence, its insistence on cutting benefits for low-income Americans is getting in the way of setting common sense policy for our farmers and ranchers as well. It's remarkable that so many people in the House would say that in the middle of an historic drought, I'm not going to vote for a farm bill that's important to our farmers and ranchers. I won't vote for it unless I can cut nutrition benefits for tens of millions of struggling Americans. That's what the House Republicans are saying. They won't vote for a farm bill that will help our farmers and ranchers, that is supported by every major farm group, all the consumer groups, the environmental groups, supported here in the Senate by a lot of Republicans, it was a bipartisan bill by the ranking member of the, of, the, of, the, of the Ag Committee, Senator Roberts of Kansas, former chair of the Agriculture Committee in the House. We passed that bill. 
And yet, the Republicans in the House are saying, unless we have these draconian cuts to nutrition programs, we won't pass a farm bill. You know, that's the kind of my way or the highway attitude of the Tea Party Republicans in the House. If they can't have it their way, their very narrow way, they won't let the rest of the House act. They won't take up a bipartisan bill passed by the Senate. Well, Mr. President, it's stunning, stunning what the House is refusing to do and refusing to pass a farm bill. All I can hope is that someone over there comes to their senses and gets that farm bill through before they adjourn and go home. Now, Mr. President, since we recessed, since we recessed around the 1st of August and just came back yesterday, our colleague on the House side, Congressman Paul Ryan, has become the vice presidential nominee for the Republican ticket under, of course, Governor Romney, who has got the nomination for president. Now, Congressman Paul Ryan is not an unknown entity, uh, not an unknown quantity. Uh, he has been around a long time. He has been chairman of the House Budget Committee, and he has put forward the so-called Ryan budget twice. Well, what is a budget? A budget is a blueprint. It's like you build a house, you have to have a blueprint. Well, a budget for a city council is a blueprint for what they want to do for the city. A state budget talks about how the state is going to move. It's forward looking. What are we going to do in the future? Federal budget's the same way. It's our blueprint. It's a blueprint that we want for how we're going to move our country forward. So we have the Ryan budget. I think it's fair for us to take a look at that blueprint and let the American people know just what's in that budget. Now, really, we face a fundamental choice in this year's election. Are we going to restore, rescue, rebuild the struggling middle class, or are we going to shift even more of our wealth and advantages to those at the top at the expense of the middle class? Well, Republicans have made clear where they stand. They did so when nearly every Republican in Congress voted for the Ryan budget plan, and Governor Romney embraced the Ryan budget as, quote, marvelous, marvelous. As I said yesterday, it's not exactly a word I think most Americans would use to describe something they liked. But I suppose if you're having tea at the Ritz and you're in that class of Americans, well, you might use the word to describe it as marvelous. Well, the very centerpiece of the Ryan budget is a dramatic shift of more wealth to those at the top, targeting huge new tax cuts for those at the top. Here's what it would do. $265,000 more per year for someone making over a million dollars a year in income. Now, that's on top of the $129,000 they're already getting for, uh, from the Bush tax cuts. So the Ryan budget would extend the Bush tax cuts and put $265,000 on top of the $129,000, which uh, comes to about around $400,000 a year if you're making over a million dollars a year. Now, we're going to hear a lot in this, this fall we're going to hear a lot about entitlements, cutting entitlements. Oh, we've got to get a handle on entitlements, people say. we just got to get it. And when they talk about entitlements, mostly Republicans talk about those programs that go to help people who are at the bottom rung of the ladder. Hmm? They're talking about things like the SNAP program, the Nutrition Assistance Program. Or they're talking about job training programs or maybe Title I, things I'm going to talk about in a minute on education. Well, what about this entitlement? This is an entitlement. If you are making over a million dollars a year under the Ryan budget, you will be entitled, entitled to over $400,000 a year in tax cuts. What about that entitlement? 
No one wants to talk about taking away that entitlement. But that's an entitlement. Well, the Republicans' tax cuts would total $4.5 trillion over 10 years. $4.5 trillion. Well, how do they pay for it? Well, they don't want to say. They don't want to say. But budget experts, tax experts understand this game very well. The Republican budget would partially offset these tax cuts by making deep and draconian cuts to programs that undergird the middle class and are essential to the quality of life in this country. Everything from education, student grants and loans, law enforcement, clean air and clean water, food safety, medical research, highways, bridges, other infrastructure. Lastly, the Republicans offset these new big tax cuts for those at the top by actually raising taxes on the middle class. Now, you heard me right. The Ryan budget would actually raise taxes on the middle class. The Nonpartisan Tax Policy Center estimates that under the Republican plan, middle class families with children would see their taxes go up on an average by more than $2,000 a year. And the bottom line is, the Ryan budget does not reduce the deficit. The Ryan budget has a deficit for the next 28 years. 28 years. The savings they gain by cutting all of these programs that undergird the middle class and by raising taxes on the middle class, basically the lion's share of that is going to go into tax cuts for the top wealthiest Americans. The truth is, Representative Ryan is not interested in balancing the budget. 2040, even under the best assumptions, his budget would not balance until 2040, 28 years from now. So as I've said, Mr. Ryan is obviously an acolyte, an acolyte of former Vice President Cheney, who once said in a kind of an unguarded moment, Deficits don't matter. Remember that? That was Vice President Cheney said that. Well, obviously, George W. Bush and his administration took that to heart because we have had the biggest deficits in history for the eight years that George Bush was president. And now, Mr. Ryan, he doesn't care about deficits. He only cares about tax cuts for the wealthy. Well, they just believe if you just give more and more and more to the top, it will magically trickle down on everyone else. And we know that doesn't work. The romney Ryan Republican plan is extreme and unbalanced. And I'm not making this up. You don't have to take it from me. Even former House Speaker Newt Gingrich criticized the Ryan budget. He called it, quote, right-wing social engineering. That's what Newt Gingrich called it, right-wing social engineering. Well, Newt, you got that one right anyway. His aim, the aim of Representative Ryan, is to use the deficit crisis as a pretext for degrading and dismantling everything from Medicare and Medicaid to education, environmental protection, workplace safety, medical and scientific research, and on and on. Again, he doubles down on the theory that if only we give more to those at the top, it will magically trickle down. Well, today, Mr. President, I'd like to focus specifically on the devastating impact of the Romney-Ryan budget on education. On education. It is an unprecedented, unprecedented assault on education funding and a grave threat that this poses to school reform efforts across the United States. Mr. President, I have an unusual perspective on this issue as both the chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee that funds our federal education programs. And I might point out that for the last 23 years, I've either been the chair of that Appropriations Subcommittee or ranking member. I've been on that subcommittee since 1985. And I'm also now the chair of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, which authorizes the education programs. And I've been on that committee since 1987. I've served under distinguished chairmen, Senator Kennedy, Senator Kassebaum, Senator Jeffords, 
Senator Gregg from New Hampshire, Senator Enzi, and now I chair it. So for all these years, I've been on both the authorizing committee and on the appropriations subcommittee. I must tell you, I've been heartened by the exciting work being done in schools across the country to improve the quality of instruction for our students, to close the achievement gap, graduate more students who are, quote, college and career ready. 45 states and the District of Columbia have collaborated to create high quality common education standards, common core standards. The Obama administration's Race to the Top initiative has jump-started ambitious state-level reforms to turn around the nation's lowest performing schools. In the HELP Committee, which I chair, working with Senator Enzi this year, we reauthorized on a bipartisan basis the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Positive changes are happening in America's schools. However, it's wishful thinking to continue to expect improvements if we continue to lay off tens of thousands of teachers, increase class sizes, and reduce instructional time. As I said, Senator Enzi and I worked very hard to get an, a reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act go through our committee, bipartisan basis. But we've been unable to get it on the floor, so we'll have to do it again next year. But if you look at the Ryan budget, if you look at the Ryan budget, we will be laying off tens of thousands of teachers. We will increase class sizes and reduce instructional time. Is that where we want to go as a country? As I said, his plan, which has been embraced by Governor Romney, would cut non-defense discretionary spending by 18.9% in fiscal year 2014. Next fiscal, well, not, not this upcoming fiscal year, but the next fiscal year. So let's take a look at what a cut of that size would mean for federal education programs. Let's take a look first at Title I. Now you say Title I, people say, what's Title I? That is the cornerstone of the federal government's support for elementary and secondary education in this country. The purpose of Title I, and by the way, this has been in the law since 1965. 1965. A great society program, I might add. And it has done a world of good for our schools all across America because its purpose was to help all students, especially those from disadvantaged backgrounds, meet high academic standards. Title I money goes to more than 90% of the nation's school districts. Schools have a lot of flexibility with Title I funds but they use the money mostly to pay the salaries of teachers and teachers' aides who are helping students who are in danger of falling behind. Well, under the Romney-Ryan budget, more than 10,000 schools across the country could lose their Title I funding in fiscal year 2014. More than 37,000 teachers could lose their jobs. So not only would this hurt students, it's going to put more people out of work. Now, this Title I program is about $14.5 billion a year. It's a national program. What we basically said in 1965, and we have said every year since, that yes, education is a local Elementary and secondary education is basically a local and state function. But we want to come in and help those areas that have low tax bases, high proportion of underprivileged kids from low-income families. We want to come in and help because there's one thing we know. A poorly educated child in one state won't necessarily grow up to be a burden in that state, that child can move to another state. And so, as a national policy, we said in 1965, and we have said every year since, under Republican presidents and under Democratic presidents, Republican Congresses and Democratic uh, Congresses, we have said Title I is an important 
national program, an important national program. The Ryan budget, if enacted, would close more than 10, would not close. I would just say that more than 10,000 schools would lose their Title I funding. Well, let's take a look at another important education program, one particularly close to me. That's the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Now, again, this has been in the law since 1975. Since 1975, the funding for this is about $11.6 billion a year. Now, again, under the Ryan budget, the Romney-Ryan budget, states could lose funding for approximately 25,000 special education teachers, age, and other staff serving children with disabilities, again, in the year 2014. 25,000. And just in one year, 2014. These are special education teachers. Now, again, I want to remind everyone, as I've said many times here on the floor, that states are required to provide a free and appropriate public education to students with disabilities. Now, a lot of people say this is a federal mandate. This is not a federal mandate. It's a constitutional mandate. Even if the federal government didn't provide one nickel to any state for IDEA, the state would still have to provide a free, appropriate public education. Because the courts have decided that if a state provides a free public education for its students, it cannot discriminate. Now, before, they said they couldn't discriminate on the basis of sex, national origin, race, Brown versus Board of Education. And under Park v. Pennsylvania, another case, they said you can't discriminate on the basis of disability. You can't say we're going to collect taxes from all these people, but you family, you with a disabled, with a kid with a disability, you're out. That kid doesn't get an education. So they said that's unconstitutional. And I think you would recognize that that is unconstitutional. So states have a constitutional requirement if they provide a free public education to provide that free, appropriate public education to kids with disabilities. So even if federal funding was cut, the states would still be, have to pay for it. They have to educate their students with disabilities. So if the Romney-Ryan budget were to pass, then what would happen is we would offload this education to the states. And what would happen? Your state and local taxes would go sky high. States and communities would still have to pay their special education teachers. If they're not getting enough from the federal government, they have to find their own tax revenues to make up the difference. Just keep in mind, under the Romney-Ryan budget, approximately 25,000 special education teachers would not be funded under IDEA in 2014. Think about that. Now, let's turn to higher education. Higher education. Since 1972, we have provided what has been known as Pell Grants, named after former Senator Claiborne Pell. Pell Grants to students who want to go to college, students who qualify because of low income. Hmm, another one of those terrible entitlements, right? If you're low income, you want to go to college, you get a Pell Grant. It has been a lifesaver for so many families who otherwise could not afford to send their kids to college. As we know, a college education now is more important than ever. New jobs in every industry from manufacturing, construction, healthcare, public administration require workers who have the skill and the education. Look what happened just in the recent recession. Workers with a college education have led the economic recovery. People with a bachelor's degree or better have gained two million jobs since the end of the recession. Meanwhile, workers with only a high school diploma or less have lost more than 230,000 jobs. There are over, I just saw it here today, over about two million jobs in America that are, that are there, but they're not being filled because of lack of qualifications for the workers. This is education. So one would hope 
that the Romney-Ryan budget, which they tout as being for creating jobs, would put a high priority on getting more people into college, but it does just the opposite. In fiscal year 2014, nearly 10 million students would see, could see their Pell Grants fall on an average by more than $1,000. So again, under the Romney-Ryan budget, the average, now this is an average, the current average award is $3,831. Under the Romney-Ryan budget, in 2014, in one fell swoop, it would go down to $2,599. For some students, that cut could mean the difference between whether they pursue higher education or not. Now let's go to the other end of the educational spectrum. I started out talking about elementary and secondary and high school. Now I'm talking, uh, and I talked about college Pell Grants. Let's look at preschool, preschool. Um, back in 1990, Two, the Council on Education funding uh, consisting of most of the CEOs of our large corporations came out with a study and report on education and what did business need? What did business in America need in the future looking at education? And they spent, I don't know, two or three years having hearings, investigating, doing all that kind of stuff. What did that report come out? Now this is a report from the business leaders of America. What did they say in that report? That education begins at birth and the preparation for education begins before birth. The whole finding was we got to put more into preschool education. That's 20 years ago, 20 years ago. Last year, just last year, the US Chamber of Commerce, 20 years later came out with another study. This is the US Chamber of Commerce, this is not these social scientists, these are hard-headed business people. What'd they say in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce report? We gotta put more money into preschool education. Well, we at the federal level have been doing that through a program called Head Start. And we've had Head Start, I think, if I'm not mistaken, since about 1968. High quality early childhood education has been proven to save taxpayer dollars in the long run by reducing the cost for welfare, special education, and might I add, criminal justice. Read that jail time. One of the highest correlative factors, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, the highest correlative factor for people who are incarcerated in our prisons is the lack of a high school education. Under the Romney-Ryan budget, up to 200,000 low-income children and their families could lose access to Head Start, again, in fiscal year 2014. I'm not talking about over the next 10 years. I'm talking about in one year, 2014. We have about 970,000 children in Head Start today. In 2014, 200,000 could leave if the Romney-Ryan budget were enacted. That's their blueprint. I have to keep reminding folks, we talked about the Romney-Ryan budget, that is their blueprint for where they want America to go. This is where they want America to go. Now let me talk about a, rel a related topic, and it has a lot to do with education, and that's child care funding, child care funding. The Child Care and Development Block Grant provides subsidies to low-income working families to help pay for child care. Now, these are families that are working, they're looking for work, they depend on these subsidies to do so, otherwise they wouldn't be able to work. By this point, it will come as no surprise that the Romney-Ryan budget could force approximately 95,000 low-income children across the country to lose access to high-quality child care in fiscal year 2014, 95,000. Well, Mr. President, I think you get the picture. The Romney-Ryan budget is a devastating assault on education at all levels. Preschool, well, even more, 
child care, which a lot of these components have education, Head Start, elementary education, secondary education, Title I, IDEA, special education, Pell Grants for college, all devastatingly reduced. Again, not over 10 years, <laughs> in year one, 2014. I'm struck by the fact that this budget of Mr. Ryan's is being proposed at a time when America's competitors are surging forward. China has tripled its investment in education and is building hundreds of new universities. Even in times of austerity and shrinking budgets, smart countries don't turn a chainsaw on themselves. They continue to invest in the future. And the most important investment in the future is an investment in education. In the months ahead, Congress will likely focus on reducing the deficit, and this is appropriate. Certainly any strategy for solving our fiscal crisis must include sensible spending cuts. But we shouldn't jeopardize our long-term economic growth and recovery by slashing education. We have a saying out in farm country, you don't eat your seed corn. You don't eat your seed corn. And our children today, that's our seed corn for the future. You don't throw them on the trash heap. Mr. President, on their own, the Romney-Ryan budget cuts to education just defy common sense. But kind of put in a broader context of their whole budget plan in its entirety. These cuts aren't just ill-considered. They really smack of class warfare. The Romney-Ryan budget demands nothing whatsoever, not one dollar, from the wealthiest, most privileged people in America. Essentially, the Romney-Ryan budget is Robin Hood in reverse. It robs from the poor and gives it to the rich. So. Let's get this straight. The American people need to know this. This is their blueprint. Under the Romney-Ryan budget, we have devastating assaults on education. Last night, I covered health care. Others will cover other topics. The senator from California covered transportation and infrastructure. So again, under, the, under this plan, the United States, under Romney Ryan, should set aside $4.5 trillion over the next te uh, decade for tax cuts, most of it going to the wealthiest 2 percent. But under the Romney Ryan budget, we cannot afford to sustain funding for public education. In addition, congressional Republicans specifically want to take away the $2,500 American Opportunity Tax Credit, used by many middle class and modest income families to help cover college costs. Again, because of Republicans' determination to further lower tax rates for the wealthy, many other middle class college tax benefits are at risk. This is outrageous. This approach does not remotely reflect the priorities and values of the American people. Mr. President, we can't, we can't be dragged backward into a winner-take-all society where the privileged and the powerful sees an even greater share of wealth, even as our middle class is struggling and declining. For nearly half a century, robust federal investments in quality public schools and access to higher education have been a critical pillar undergirding the American middle class. The Romney-Ryan budget takes a jackhammer to that pillar. Going back to the 1930s, the American people have supported and strengthened a uniquely American social contract. That social contract says that we will prepare our young and care for our elderly. That contract says if you work hard and play by the rules, you'll be able to rise to the middle class and even beyond. That social contract says that a cardinal role of government is to provide a ladder of opportunity 
so that every American can realistically aspire to the American dream. In one fell swoop, the Romney-Ryan blueprint budget would rip up that social contract. It would replace it with a survival of the fittest, winner-take-all philosophy that tells struggling, aspiring Americans and their communities, tough luck, you're on your own. As President Clinton said in his speech last week, there are two philosophies at work here. The Romney-Ryan blueprint budget, which says, tough luck, you're on your own. If you win the lottery, you're okay. If you don't, too bad. Or the philosophy being proposed by President Obama and so many of us here, that we're all in this together. The rising tide lifts all boats. That we have a social contract that we have adhered to for nearly 80 years now. We'll, we'll care for our, we'll invest in our young, care for our elderly. We'll make sure there's a ladder or ramp of opportunity for the middle of class. The tough luck, you are on your own philosophy of the Romney-Ryan budget is not the kind of America that, our parent, that my parents wanted or that they built for their children. It's not the kind of America that my neighbors in Iowa or across this country want to see. So in the weeks ahead, our nation faces an absolutely fundamental choice. Again, I repeat, are we going to rescue, restore, and rebuild the middle class? Or are we going to continue to shift even more wealth and advantages to those at the top at the expense of the middle class? Mr. President, accumulation of riches by the wealthiest in our society is not the same as wealth creation by a society. If we're truly interested in creating wealth by our society, we should be investing in education, making sure there is a ladder or ramp of opportunity, by making sure that, that the benefits of our society go to those with new ideas and new information. And those people may be kids from very low income families. They may be kids with disabilities. That's true wealth creation of a society, not just giving more to people at the top. So again, the Romney-Ryan budget makes exactly the wrong choice. Exactly the wrong choice. I disagree with that budget. America remains a tremendously wealthy and resourceful nation. Again, when you listen to Romney and Ryan budget, when you look at it, it's sort of premised on the fact that we're busted. We're broke. We can't afford child care. We can't afford Title I. We can't afford Pell Grants. We can't afford them. We're broke. But we can find tax breaks for the wealthiest. And we're not broke. America remains the wealthiest society, the wealthiest country the world has ever seen. We have the highest per capita income of any major nation. So it kind of begs the question, doesn't it, Mr. President? If we're so rich, why are we, why are we so poor? Why are we so broke? It's because there's been a misallocation of capital. More and more going to fewer and fewer. Not enough being used to educate our kids, provide a good college education, make sure we have the highest qualified teachers in all of our schools, that we have the best principals, that we have a school system that is second to none in the world. And that's the kind of America that we should have and that we can afford to do. We can afford to do this if we have the right blueprint, the right budget, the Romney-Ryan budget takes us down the wrong road. The middle class is the backbone of this country. We have to rescue, restore, and rebuild it. And we need leaders who have the backbone to do that for our middle class. It's not in the Romney-Ryan budget. 
So, Mr. President, last night I spoke about the devastation on health care. I just covered what would happen in education. Next, I'm going to come on the floor and talk about what's going to happen to working families. What's going to happen to people in America when we take away some of the protections they have so they don't get injured, they don't get sick, so that they can show up for work every day healthy? So we're going to look again at the devastation of that. Others will come on the floor and talk about the infrastructure and what that means for America. Well, I don't often agree with Newt Gingrich, as people know, but he was right. This is right-wing social engineering. We don't need that in America. But Mr. Romney and Mr. Ryan have put their stamp of approval on it. And the American people need to know what's in that budget, and we intend to tell them between now and the time that we adjourn and go home. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor.